Uh, hello to everyone uh, and welcome to the third edition of uh, International E-Commerce Day. Uh, my name is Albert and I'm going to be your host for the next hour. Uh, I would like to thank all of you for uh, attending this event. And uh, I would also like to thank you, our dear partners, GetResponse, for, uh, for their support. Uh, also remember that after the presentation of uh, Manuel, we're going to have a live, a live uh, a q a session where you can ask all your questions uh, also please do not forget that uh, we have a, a competition going meaning that if you find any good insights that uh, are worth uh, uh, sharing it on on social media then use the hashtag uh, ecom ecom day 2017 and you'll get the chance to uh, win a, an only convert account worth uh, nine thousand uh, dollars uh, so now it's my pleasure to present uh, Manuel Da Costa. Uh, he's a conversion rate specialist and he's currently leading um, uh, the efforts at Effective Experiment, being in charge of pro product development and uh, growth. Uh, his keynote will give you a lot of insights on how to set up and make your e-commerce experimentation program work. So Manuel, I will give the floor to you now. Hey guys, thank you uh, there for the intro. Um, welcome to my session at uh, e-commerce day. Uh, I'm really happy to be here and talking to you about how to build uh, high growth teams at your e-commerce company. So I'm going to share my screen first and then we can take it from there. Um, so this talk is all about setting and scaling your e-commerce uh, experimentation program. Uh, so Everyone knows that conversion optimization is really important. Uh, you want to be experimenting if you want to outgrow your competitors. And a lot of e-commerce companies have woken up to that fact. They know that CRO is important. And they look at all these companies achieving some really good um, um, conversion uplifts. And they want to do the same. So this talk is all about how you can do the same in your company depending on, you know, it doesn't matter which stage you're at, I'll be covering the entire growth cycle over there. So uh, who am I and why you should be listening to me? My name is Manuel da Costa. As I said in the intro, um, I am the founder and I lead product and growth at Effective Experiments. Um, I love optimization. I love tinkering and changing and optimizing uh, processes and improving efficiency. And that's what CRO is, right? Uh, is, right? Um, I've also founded a, a an online community, a community called Conversion World. Uh, you can join that if you want to talk to other CRO people around. Um, so enough about me. Uh, you're not here to hear about me, but you are hear about learning how to grow and scale your optimization program. So firstly, let me tell you what this talk isn't about. This talk's not about uh, how to run an A-B test, okay? There are better talks out there that will give you an uh, entire step-by-step -step process on how to build and run A-B tests. Uh, this is not about tactics that you should try or which testing tool to use, uh, though we recommend OmniConvert. Uh, it also does, it's not going to tell you about how to analyze tests or go into statistics or anything of that sort. Um, before we jump into the meat of the, of the talk, I want to talk to show you a few statistics about the industry. Uh, so this is uh, something that was done by eConsultancy, a survey that they put out. And it said, which um, three digital areas are top priorities for your organization in 2017. And if you look at the first and the third one, which is targeting and personalization and conversion optimization, you see these are really high priorities in the, organiza in the organizations in 2017. Um, we also ran a similar survey at Conversion World, and we asked uh, uh, folks on uh, the company side as well as agency side whether budgets have increased uh, or decreased. And uh, a lot of people uh, have said uh, that budgets have gone up. They've increased uh, on, on the agency side as well. Um, looking at activities, uh, the activities um, for agencies have also increased. And on the client side, they've also increased. Um, so in my role at Effective Experiments, I have the pleasure of speaking to uh, companies, large and small agencies all around the world. And the, the reason I talk to them is obviously their interest in our platform, but more, 
more than not, I am interested in their processes, what they do, how they execute their optimization programs, and what their challenges are. And let me tell you this. Um, over time, I've conducted at least about 500 odd interviews, maybe more. I've seen some good optimization programs. I've seen some bad optimization programs, and I've seen some really ugly optimization programs. And, and the thing is, there is a shocking truth about conversion optimization programs. And it's a simple truth. They are not done well. Optimization programs are not done well. Firstly, there isn't a standard, okay? So we're gonna talk about those reasons. So let's look at those reasons why, okay? Why are we seeing so many optimization programs in companies, large and small, not done well? The first reason is plain and simple. There is no standard in the industry right now. If I was to compare one agency versus another agency, even if they're on the same maturity level or one company with another company, there would be a difference in the way they go about their CRO workflow. There is no, um, no similarities, no guidelines, and there is a big gap in knowledge as well. So people are starting to come through into CRO from different fields. Maybe they're coming from digital marketing, maybe they're coming from SEO. So there is a big gap over there. The second reason why optimization programs don't work is because there is no buy-in. Now you might think, hang on, our stakeholders or the management in our company has given us all this money to build a CRO team. There is buy-in. No, there isn't. The reason for that is because when we look at buy-in, it's not the money or the budget, but how easily the other teams in the company support you. So your your um, design teams, your, your other marketing teams, your development uh, uh, folks, are they supporting your optimization efforts? And usually we see that is not the case. So there is definite um, lag or, or sorry, gaps in interdepartmental buy-in. And the other thing which I said earlier as well is that there is no structured process. If we were to compare two companies, they they, their processes would vary. So when we surveyed people at Conversion World, we asked them uh, this question, do you agree or disagree? We have a strong, well-defined process for our optimization program. And you can see about 33% of them actually disagree uh, to that fact, and that 31% are neither here nor there. A key factor that also derails optimization programs is the lack of resources. Sure, you come up with loads of ideas. Sure, you come up with loads of tests that you're ready to you know, push live and make lots of money on, on your checkout page, on your product page, whatever that is, right? But what if you can't get that going because your developer's too busy with other things or your management isn't, uh, is stopped doing uh, other jobs? So here we go. We looked at um, that survey again and we asked people, you know, how, uh, what are the problems you face when deploying um, tests or when running your optimization program? And lack of resources comes up way up there as one of the main reasons. So we looked at um, the ways people set up optimization programs. And as I said, it's not done well. It's a broken process. And the reason for that is because the way we set up optimization programs is, is we go uh, uh, through it the wrong way around. People always start with tools. They look at the platforms that they should be using to run their A-B tests and their, their optimization programs, but tools do not make an optimization program, right? Tools do not help you um, build culture. Tools do not help you execute. They're tools. Sure, they will help you create the test and run the test and get all the stats and stuff like that. But your optimization program should not start and end with the tools. It should be part of that process. But if you want tools, right, go for it. There's loads of tools out there. You can pick and choose if you want, you know, there's go, go to that link over there, conversionoptimization.tools, and, and find there's a full list of tools over there. Pick your poison. 
And then we also come to this new black box technology of artificial intelligence and machine learning and whatever. Okay. And this is being treated like the cure. Like if you can get machine learning and personalization, it'll fix your problems, but it's far from it. Your optimization program shouldn't start with tools. When we look at optimization programs, whether it's in, in, especially in smaller companies that are just starting out, if, especially if yours is just starting out, you may find this quite relevant. Look at this, look at this little comic strip over here, right? It says, I want a real team effort on this project. Now, there's one thing that's right about this, and there's one thing wrong on this as well. Um, do you wanna know what, what the, uh, the wrong thing is? The word project. Okay, so if you're treating conversion optimization or your optimization program as a project, you will fail because optimization shouldn't be a project. It shouldn't be treated as a one-off event that happens for a few months and then you decide, yeah, let's see if we should continue with this or not. Optimization should be baked into your company's DNA. It should be a business as usual activity. Okay, if you have that short term, um, if you if you the short term, you're not going to succeed. Optimization has to be something that is run. Silos are a common in companies. The bigger the bigger the company, the bigger the problem. If you're a small team, you can be agile. People are sat around more or less next to each other. You can get things done. But the the more the company grows, you start become uh, start forming silos. So you'll have a team of developers sat in one area, just with them, uh, you know, doing their own stuff. Designers in one side, the optimizers trying to do their own stuff. So you're forming silos, which basically slows everything down, and you don't really get uh, further ahead with your optimization program. So I said about looking at some successful uh, optimization um, programs run by some really well-known companies out there. Um, and this is what I'm going to be talking about next and exploring what they've done that's uh, been successful. Now bear in mind that this is not to say that they, theirs is the template you should follow, but even they are sort of all, always optimizing their process, but from what they have learned, they've shared this with, with people on the internet. So we're looking at uh, companies like Spotify or Skyscanner or Booking.com and how they've gone about creating these optimization programs from the ground up. Your common method, which I said, you know, you're working in silos, you'll have your dev team sitting in one place, your testing team in another place, your de uh, development team, et cetera, all these sitting in little silos. Whereas what Spotify and all these other companies uh, mentioned earlier, what they've done is they've created cross-functional teams. And by cross-functional teams, I mean, I mean you, have one you have a developer, a designer, a an optimization person, a UX person, all working together as one team. And you have multiple teams uh, of those cross-functional skills working towards the same goal. So let's look at Spotify, for example. They've broken it down based on squads. And squads uh, and tribes, however you want to call them, are basically uh, set up to deal with one part of the product or the platform. Um, now, again, I'm not saying this is something that you should go and do in your um, uh, in your e-commerce company because maybe you're not big enough for Spotify right now. You shouldn't. You, but look at the principles, right? So you have different squads, cross-functional squads, working on a different part of the platform, but all working towards the same goal. You also have try. Uh, you also have um, guilds and chapters. Chapters are basically people with similar skills from different squads, so they can meet and share their knowledge. And you have guilds, people with similar interests, so maybe a developer is interested in UX or a, a designer is interested in development. You have um, those people club together as guilds. And what that does is it allows people to share ideas. It allows them to tell each other what's working in their testing and what's not working. And that allows a cross-pollination of ideas. If you're sitting in your little silo of um, 
of uh, developers or designers or test, uh, testing um, professionals, you might end up in this scenario where it becomes an us versus them. We're doing a great job, but they aren't because they're a different team. So you end up in, in the wrong mentality altogether. But if you have it set up in this way, we have a cross-functional team all working towards the same goal, but then people with similar skills meeting up or with similar interests meeting up to share their knowledge, to share their learnings, that's when you start getting real momentum because they can feed off each other and inspire each other to, to move forward. So at this stage you're thinking, right, you've got Spotify, you've got Skyscanner, they're doing great things. Uh, you know, some other e-commerce companies like, even like Shopify, for example, might be doing some really good things. But how can I do this in my company? And this is what I'm going to be dealing with uh, in this next section. I want to show you in a practical manner how you can transform your organization um, for high velocity uh, optimization. So no matter where you are in the maturity level, you can scale up over time. And I'm going to show you uh, some... Um, some strategies for wherever you are in uh, this pipeline. I want to introduce you to the three pillars of optimization. You might be thinking what they are. And I'll tell you right now. People, processes, and priority. And I'll be covering those shortly. Tools are not one of them. If you've been listening to me over the last few, um, 15 minutes that I've been speaking, I've been fairly clear. Tools are important. They help you on your tests, but they're not part of your optimization program. You've got bigger things to deal with. And let's start with people. People are the most important asset when it comes to optimization. You want to hire the right people. You want to hire people that are, that are motivated, that are enthusiastic, and more importantly, curious. They're, they're keen to look at, into the data, research, and find insights that can help them drive tests forward. So have a really strong um, hiring process that you're, you want to bring in the best talent or upskill your existing talent. Let's start if you're just starting out, your company is small, and you don't have a CRO person in place. How do you go from there? So at this stage, you may want to look at upskilling your existing digital marketing uh, professional. Maybe you are a digital marketing professional and you want to do CRO, you can do it part-time. Um, and this is where we, where we call this person the jack of all trades, because resources are low, but you want to make an impact. So this jack of all trades has to prove the case for CRO in the company, or uh, if you're the management, you want to make sure that you have a business case to invest more into CRO. So think about things that you can do during this stage. One person working part-time, limited resources, what can you do? Focus on tests that will deliver high impact. When I say high impact means that you're not testing button colors, you're not testing headlines, or you're not testing something on the homepage. Go straight for things that will deliver revenue through your tests. So things like your Checkout page, okay? What can you test on the checkout page that's gonna get more people completing that checkout? How can you prevent cart abandonment? Look closer to the money point, and that's where you wanna optimize all your tests at this stage. Time is limited, resources are limited. You wanna prove your, your case now. You might also wanna bring in additional resources, like maybe uh, you wanna bring in an outside agency to um, help you with this or if you're struggling with uh, development resources, uh, there is a good uh, resource online called uh, testing.agency that can help you with this. So definitely look for stuff like this, um, but prove your case quick. Time is of the essence. Okay, so let's move, that was level one. Let's move to level two, right? So you now have a dedicated CRO resource. Maybe you've proven your case, uh, and now you have also a front-end developer that can design these tests for you. And you also have a UX designer who can make it look good. Um, and all you then need to do is go ahead and uh, deploy it, right? So here you've scaled up a bit. The challenges now are trying to get people involved with your testing. This is not the, the people you're working with, obviously, but the stakeholders and other, uh, other team members 
Uh, you want to show them what's happening over time, get that buy-in, get people enthusiastic about testing and about the results, right? Because the results are the main thing you're looking for. Um, once you start moving up the ladder, you start getting more people. Okay, so you get you get uh, even more resources like a, a quality assurance lead, a web analyst, and you've got your existing team, you can start scaling up. Uh, level four, obviously now the conversion optimizer takes more of a management role. It's a conversion manager and you're dealing with all these multidisciplinary uh, members in your team, you've got a psychologist, you've got uh, you know, a web analyst, a statistician, etc. And these are people who are going to be specialized in, in giving you insights or giving uh, before the, running the test or insights after running the test as well. So you've scaled up over time. Um, there is no level five in this presentation. Uh, people always ask me what happens at level five, right? Um, I think it's robots are going to take your job and we're just going to be out on the street. But that's a different story. So here's that maturity level. As you, as you scale up, uh, the number of people um, interested in, uh, you know, dedicated to optimization grows. You get more, you get um, bigger teams. But with those bigger teams come different challenges, right? So this is the next thing we're going to cover, which is process. Process is another really important facet of your optimization program. If you do a, a search online for any conversion optimization process, you would have come across uh, wider funnels, uh, infinity process. As you can see, uh, they have uh, the whole thing where they go through research and uh, going through analytics and persuasion, and then they're going through the whole point about hypothesis creation and designing and running the test, etc., and validating the test. So it's an infinity loop. Um, the other one that you may have seen is a research Excel. Again, this is all the insights that they're deriving through a heuristic analysis and mouse tracking and web analytics, etc., and the process of deriving insights. But ultimately, you know, ignore the fancy names, infinity loop and research Excel and stuff. Uh, optimization, the process is really simple, but yet really hard to do. I'll tell you what, what it is. So, as you can see, this is the conversion optimization program courtesy of acquireconvert.com. And you can see that any conversion optimization process needs to start with that first question. Why are we doing this? Why are we running an optimization program? Why are we doing A-B tests? Is it because uh, we saw this in a talk that we should be doing it? What are we trying to optimize, right? To get those business goals, what are we trying to achieve by doing an optimization program? Then you go into your data, dig through your data, your, your analytics, your heat maps, your click maps, your session replays, user tests, pull out insights from there, collect that data, analyze it, what looks right, what looks wrong, where are the gaps, and come up with your hypothesis. Design your tests, build your tests, QA it, test it out, and then ultimately learn from it. So your ideation process is fairly straightforward. You, you, you dig in through your, you get ideas, not from thin air, but you get it from data. Write that down. You don't get ideas from thin air, you get it from your data. And that's through surveys, user research, your live chat, your heuristic analysis, your analytics and your heat maps. That's where your ideas are coming from. You're using the insights that you gain from that to pull it into your, uh, into your uh, hypothesis creation, your idea generation um, spreadsheet, or whatever you're using for that. And the next bit is coming up with a hypothesis. And you're thinking, okay, what do we do now? And here's where I see people fail, right? You're thinking, we just test this idea, right? Can't we just test this idea? Why should we have a hypothesis? And that every test that you run should have a strong hypothesis. So here's Craig Sullivan, uh, and he has a really good uh, hypothesis toolkit, uh, which is, if you see on the screen, it says, because we saw whatever we saw in the data, qualitative or quantitative data, or and quantitative data, uh, we expect to see whatever for, for whatever the segment you're testing on, and it'll cause an impact. And we expect to see uh, the, the metrics change over a period of X business cycles. Okay, so it's a strong uh, format that you can use to create your hypothesis anytime you run a test or before you run a test. Okay, so you've got your, you've come up with an idea, 
you've built a hypothesis around it. Your hypothesis is basically your line in the sand, right? You're trying to figure out, is this hypothesis going to be validated or not based on the results? You're not just gonna say, yeah, we throw it out there and then look at the results and see what it tells us. You have to set those rules at the start and those rules are your hypothesis. Um, and then once you've got your list of ideas and your hypothesis, you want to start uh, plotting it out on your roadmap. You want to build a roadmap of your tests uh, and plot it out. So you're, you're testing um, your test on conflict. You don't have issues with uh, tests uh, that don't uh, give results because they've overlapped with another test. So create a roadmap and d develop your testing uh, pipeline. What are you going to be testing this week, next week, next quarter, etc. Before you run your test, you want to QA your tests. I've seen so many tests break because they have not done QA properly. So you want to QA your experiments, make sure that they run properly on all, all browsers or whichever browsers you've set them on, that all the goals are firing correctly, the analytics are being tracked correctly. And only once you've passed that, then go ahead and deploy that test. What is the goal of that test? Sure, you you know you want that experiment, you want that test to succeed, but ultimately, you want to answer this question: What can we learn from this experiment? It doesn't matter if uh, a test fails or succeeds. A test will never fail if you if you learn from it, right? I, I often hear like, "Oh, we've had X amount of, of uh, failures in our testing program." I don't like the word failure because it it sends the negative a negative connotation to. Uh, your stakeholders to say, hey, we're not succeeding in our testing program. As long as you're learning, you're succeeding. And if you're using those learnings to then drive the next set of tests forward, that's where you start seeing the change, the momentum in your testing program. The final pillar of your, your testing um, optimization program, of growing an optimization program in your e-commerce uh, company, sorry, wrong uh, slide there, uh, is your um, priority, okay, I've got the wrong event over there for some reason, it's just catching my eye, but um, your conversion optimizers should be treated like superheroes in your company. These are the people who are going to be finding those insights, digging out those insights, and um, creating tests that are gonna, going to drive your revenue up, that, that's gonna drive your, your um, conversions up and that's going to give you uh, an edge over your competitors. If you're a manager managing an e-commerce company, seriously, treat your optimizers well. And if you do, they will really help you succeed as well if they feel appreciated. Don't be a hippo that wants to put in their own ideas, that wants to give their own suggestions and really shoots down anything else that an optimizer says. So we're talking about priority, right? So if you have the right people and the right processes in place, but your hippo just shoots your ideas down or doesn't give you any uh, leeway in running your tests or uh, a budget or you know giving a say, uh, giving you a say at the table. That means you don't value the person. You're not giving priority to the optimization uh, uh, process. You're not giving priority to the people running the optimization process. So, um, CRO should be a priority if you want to succeed. Identify where your bottlenecks happen. Okay, think of uh, your um, CRO um, workflow as a factory, right? So things are going, they're going from planning to designing to development, etc. You want to look at it and see in your optimization program where those bottlenecks happen. Because if you see, let's say for example, you have your test pipeline built out you see experiments that are stuck in approval phase or they're stuck in the QA phase, you get visibility on that. You can figure out why those tests are getting stuck in that and you can optimize that process. You can become more efficient in your optimization process itself. And doing that allows you to build, become um, efficient um, with that well-oiled optimization program. So, Let's look at this. Look, let's look at this Venn diagram. Okay, so this is the three pillars that we talked about. We have people, we have process, and priority. Now, if we have uh, people 
and uh, priority but no process, then you're getting haphazard testing. If you have process and priority, but not the right people, then if you don't have the right people, you've got people who are doing amateur CRO, right? And they're gonna be testing button colors, they're gonna be testing stuff that they read on blogs rather than looking at data. They will follow the process, but they will not know what to test. And then finally, if you have people and process, but no priority, you will have people sat there, bored out of their heads, undervalued, and they will not then be motivated to help you, your company succeed. So a successful optimization program uh, requires all three. It requires a good mix of people, processes, processes, strong processes, and priority. So let's look at the, the key takeaways from this talk. So you've learned about why optimization programs don't work. What are the pitfalls that you need to avoid in your company? It doesn't matter where you are in your company, those pitfalls happen everywhere. Okay. The other thing we talked about was what successful companies are doing. And if you want to emulate that, that's fine. But it depends on which stage you're at. And I showed you strategies that you need to do at each of those stages, how you're going to communicate, how you're going to start um, uh, talking to your stakeholders, how you're going to start communicating with your team. And then finally, we talked about how those three pillars, uh, people, process and priority come together to help you uh, uh, create a full optimization program. So I'm interested in learning about your program. I'd love you to, I'd love to get in touch with you or you know, for you to get in touch with that. There's my email, manuel at effectiveexperiments.com. Uh, find me on LinkedIn or tweet me at digital underscore tonic. And that's uh, my talk for e-commerce day. I think I am on time. I think there might be some Q&A after this. But uh, I shall go back to the slide over here and see what we have. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, hi, Manuel. Uh, thanks a lot for, for your presentation. Uh, I think you raised a lot of uh, great questions regarding how we should properly approach uh, conversion rate optimization. And in the same time, you gave uh, valuable insights regarding the pillars that actually build a really good uh, conversion rate optimization program. So yeah. really thank you for that. Uh, guys, thank you as well for, uh, for being, uh, uh, being active in, uh, in this, uh, this session. If you have any questions, please, uh, um, oh, we have one, Pedro Mengas here. Um, I'm going to read it to you, Manuel, and... Uh... I think he's just waiting to type the question, right? Yeah, right, exactly, yeah. <laughs> so we're going to wait a bit. Uh, guys, after this session is over, we're going to have another session uh, with uh, Mustafa, and he's going to talk a bit about the best practices in choosing... Uh, uh, the right uh, apps for, for your business. Um, a question from um, uh, Sumanta first. So when it comes to QA, do you recommend any tool to test various mobile devices out there? Yeah, so there are, there are quite a lot of uh, different uh, tools that you can use. Uh, so we use, uh, there, there are different types, right? So you've got a tool like Browser Stack. Um, there's also um, I'm trying to think of the other names. Uh, there's browser stack that can do virtual as well as real devices. Um, I'll post in the resources. I can't I think on the top of my head, but there are qu quite a few uh, sites out there that allow you to connect with a complete library of actual physical devices like mobiles, tablets, etc., that you can use that you can plug into and um, test your um, test your experiments on that. Uh, so Samantha, just tweet me. I'll send you a link to all of those later on. Cool. Uh, and the question from Pedro is, how do you motivate people to use tools and strategies needed to do that? Gamify it, right? So people, people will not just do it because you tell them to do it. So try and, try and make it easier for them. So you remember when I said you need to come up with a strong hypothesis and you know, get them to think of it in terms of hypothesis. At the start, if you're trying to embed this culture of CRO in a company and people are like, oh, what's hypothesis? You know, for us as conversion optimizers, we know what a hypothesis is. We know the importance of it, but not everyone does and not everyone cares. So how do we change that? 
we change the wording. Let's bet on it. Let's put it, let's put five pounds, five euros on it or five pounds on it, whatever that is. Uh, and see if, um, you know, your idea succeeds or my idea succeeds or someone else's idea succeeds, right? Gamified, make it, uh, make it yeah. fun for them. And then also have like leaderboards have things like where they can, they can see that their ideas are accepted. They're feeling valued. They're feeling part of that process. Um, so you want to almost give them, make it easy for them, uh, and also make it fun for them. Um, yeah. So, cool. So, another question from Samantha. Uh, how do you think the top bosses of several e-commerce sites are seeing the impact being created by CROs? So here's the thing, right? So they're, they're seeing the impact created by CROs on the internet, on, on blogs. They're reading up on all of this, right? But we all know that what they see over there is just the, the good stuff. They don't see all the bad stuff. So when they see what's happening in their own company and they see these tests failing, they're quick to judge that. They, they, they want to see that, okay, right, why aren't we getting the same results as what we're reading on blogs? So there's an education gap there. We need to be teaching the management or teaching the stakeholders what an actual CRO process actually is to set their expectations right. The impact is definitely there, but the impact is not always in successful tests. The impact is created in are we learning from, your, from our tests? Are we learning from our experiments? How are we able to use those learnings to move forward and to improve the, the overall customer experience? That's where the real value of CRO is. Sure, and the last question from Sumanta, uh, how to better manage momentum making and perfectionist in a startup world? Uh, so if I'm reading this right, this is basically, you're, you're trying to say moving faster but trying to be perfect at the same time, I, I'm not 100% sure what that question actually is. So maybe yeah. Samantha can, can elaborate a little bit. I can have a look at that, but I'm assuming it means one thing, but I'm not sure. Yeah, so Samantha, please, if you can elaborate a bit on, uh, on this question. Okay, yeah. so, moving so, to, so how to better manage moving faster and getting high ROI and tests, right? So. Here's the thing, uh, moving faster, you probably set KPIs like, okay, we need to run X amount of tests every month. We need to do you know, 10 tests or 20 mm -hmm. tests because again, we've seen those people doing, you know, that company doing so many tests every, every month. That shouldn't be the case. You want to uh, maximize for learning, so run tests, uh, move faster to learn, learn as fast as you can because the faster you learn, the ROI comes as, as a result of it anyways. Um, perfectionism, Again, I'm not 100% sure, but moving faster, you want to be moving faster to learn faster because as a startup, you want to learn, right? You want to gain, uh, keep uh, getting all those learnings and improve from there. Sure, sure. Uh, uh, great. Uh, uh, Manu, uh, thanks for, uh, for the uh, 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 yeah, has another. Oh, okay. okay. Just uh, uh, validating the, your answer. Awesome. So guys, uh, stay tuned. We're going to have another uh, talk in uh, approximately 10 minutes. Manuel, once again, thank you and have a great day. Thanks a lot, guys. Speak soon. Bye. Bye.